of the afternoon talks on this first Tuesday of Nobel Conference 32. This morning, we heard from Dr. Duane Rumbaugh about psychology and intelligence and language acquisition among the primates. For our first talk this afternoon, we turn our attention to the social context in which these primates live. Dr. Franz de Waal has gained an international reputation as a researcher into the society and the culture of primates. His research is worthy for our discussion and for our attention here at Nobel Conference, even if it focused only on the primates and what we can learn and what he has to tell us about them. But Dr. DeWall's research, especially his recent publications, goes, go much further to locate the origins of human morality in biology, to demonstrate how ethical behavior can be explained in evolutionary terms thus asking provocative questions which bring humans and their primate cousins closer together on so many different levels. His research findings reflect the best traditions of scientific inquiry, elegant experimental methods, rigorous collection and analysis of empirical data, and a strong sense of care and respect for the subjects of his research. Dr. DeWall was born in the Netherlands and trained as a zoologist and ethologist in the European tradition at three different Dutch universities. He received a PhD in biology from the University of Utrecht in 1977. In 1975, he was part of a six-year project initiated on the world's largest captive colony of chimpanzees at the Arnhem Zoo. Apart from a large number of scientific papers, this research found its way to the general public with the publication of his first book in 1982 entitled Chimpanzee Politics. In 1981, Dr. DeWall moved to the United States accepting a research position at the Wisconsin Primate, Regional Primate Research Center in Madison. There he began both observational and experimental studies of reconciliation behavior, behavior in monkeys. In 1989, he received the Los Angeles Times Book Award for his book Peacemaking Among Primates, a popularized account of 15 years of his research on conflict resolution among non-human primates. Since the mid-1980s, Dr. DeWall has also worked with chimpanzees at the Yerkes Regional Primate Research Center in Atlanta, and in 1991, he accepted a joint position at the Yerkes Regional Primate Research Center and in the psychology department at Emory University in Atlanta. His current interests include food sharing, social reciprocity, and conflict resolution in primates, as well as the origins of morality and justice in human society. This latter topic resulted in a third, his most recent book, Good Natured, published this year. The research of Dr. DeWall is funded by the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Mental Health, the National Institutes of Health, and private foundations. One measure of the quality and the relevance of Dr. DeWall's work is that one can find scholars and experts applying the things that he has discovered in so many different fields of inquiry. His work has direct relevance to several subfields in biology and psychology. Uh, we have found business leaders using concepts from his books to describe politics and strategic thinking in corporations. The Speaker of the United States House of Representatives, the Honorable Newt Gingrich, placed the book Chimpanzee Politics on a list of books that he said that incoming members of the United States of House of Representatives should read. <clears throat> As Dr. DeWall observed yesterday, perhaps the book Peacemaking Among Primates would have been a wiser choice for our legislators. <clears throat> Dr. DeWall's talk this afternoon is entitled Chimpanzee Behavior and the Origins of Human Morality and Justice. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Franz DeWall. Thank you for the nice introduction and also thank the organizers for organizing this event. The question quoted this morning, whether one needs to be uh, human to be humane, um, is a question that I would like to rephrase a little bit differently today uh, and ask you, if an extraterrestrial observer was watching us and just from watching us and other animals, how we treat each other, would this observer conclude that there's only one moral creature on this planet? I personally don't think so, and I'm, I'm not convinced that if he were to conclude that, that he would pick our species as necessarily the moral species of the bunch. 
I think it's very hard based on behavior alone to decide if a species is moral or not. And this raises, of course, also a lot of interesting questions about morality and its functionality, if it's so hard to detect on the basis of behavior alone. And behavior is all we can go by if we look at um, non-human primates. If we search for morality in the animal kingdom, that's all we can do. Now, searching for morality in the animal kingdom by itself is bound to challenge uh, religion and philosophy. And some would say it probably challenges God. So if I go up and smoke before your eyes, that's probably a disagreement from above with the opinions that I'm expressing. Uh, it also challenges science, and that's because science has a very cynical view of animals, and of humans, I should add. Uh, if animals kill and maim each other, that's the animals as we know them. Uh, if animals are nice and cooperative with each other, uh, we need to come up with all sorts of special explanations to make sense of their behavior. And let me try the first slide. Is that visible? The, this is Robert Yerkes, and Robert Yerkes already knew how problematic it was to talk in a certain fashion about animals. He had two um, uh, apes. He didn't know they were of different species at the time. They, they are bonobo on the right-hand side and a chimpanzee on the left-hand side. The bonobo was called Prince Chim, and the chimpanzee was called Pan Z. And uh, I'm supposed to be able to walk off the stage. Huh? <laughs> Prince Chim uh, is a bonobo, and Prince Chim took care of Pan Z. Pan Z was a very sick animal, uh, had tuberculosis, and uh, Prince Chim was very gentle with her, very considerate of her. And Yerkes wrote in one of his books, he was a great admirer of Prince Chim, if I were to tell of his altruism and sympathetic behavior towards Pan Z, I should be suspected of idealizing an ape. So he knew already that exposing the nice side, so to speak, of animals could get them into problems. Talking about violence or competition or aggression has never been a problem. That's fine. No one will worry about that. The standard view is still um, that in nature and in animal societies that there is no place for unfit individuals, for individuals who have trouble surviving. They either perish or they are eliminated. And it has even gotten to the point where survival of that sort of individuals is considered proof of moral decency in the human species. So here you see a list of um, fossils. Paleontologists have found fossil remains of individuals who could, uh, if we go down the list here, a Neanderthaler who could not masticate food. Um, Cyanida one is a crippled individual. Romito two is a dwarf. Uh, the Windover boy is a severely handicapped individual, and Crab, of course, is a fic fictional character based on one of these. Uh, but what this, what this shows is that individuals who um, survive into adulthood, who are severely handicapped, uh, the assumption of the paleontologist is that it's only possible if others are, uh, either care, take care of them or extremely tolerant of them, and they consider that proof of moral decency. Now, let's look at, at the primate record. This is um, a rhesus monkey, a trisomic rhesus monkey. It's very similar to sort of the, the Down syndrome condition in the human species, uh, where we, we have, instead of a pair of chromosomes, we have three chromosomes. And this is a retarded monkey in uh, the rhesus colony uh, at the Wisconsin Primate Center. Now, this monkey did very well and was very well taken care of by her sisters and by her mother and by the rest of the group. They were actually very friendly with her. Uh, this shows her at a later age. Um, she survived till, is this focused or it's not focused? She survived until 32 uh, months of age and she was very well taken care of and in some cases even uh, care that we could call special care, sort of things that sisters were doing to her that they normally would not do with uh, monkeys of her age. Another example is Mozu, is a Japanese macaque female who must now be like 25 years old if she's still alive, at least she was alive a couple of years ago and um, she has raised five offspring. And what is remar remarkable about her is that she doesn't have hands and feet. She misses hands and feet. And here you see a close-up of her hands and feet. And here you see her walking. 
And what is so remarkable is that she lives in uh, uh, near Nagano, which is actually the area where the Winter Olympics are going to be held next time, uh, an area that's covered with snow and ice for a long period of time. And so uh, the, the monkeys of her troop normally travel from tree to tree to avoid the snow layer, but she has to plow through the snow. That's the only thing she can do, often with an, uh, an infant on her back. And she has survived all this time. And so we can find in the animal kingdom examples of crippled individuals who survive. And so in terms of the paleontologists, we would say there are signs of moral decency there. I wouldn't necessarily conclude that. I would just say that the level of tolerance of this sort of individuals is much higher than many people assume. And I will later get into other issues of tolerance. This is food sharing at the Yerkes Primate Center, the sort of research that I work on. Uh, and of course, it's also related to this, is that uh, in chimpanzees, we find that individuals don't necessarily keep everything for themselves, but also are able to share with other individuals. Now, if natural selection favors the strong over the weak, as we all learn, uh, how could there possibly be room for kindness in the animal kingdom? Isn't nature red in tooth and claw, as the poet Tennyson said? Uh, just to give you a very realistic picture of nature here. This is, no, this is unrealistic. This is uh, nature red in tooth and claw, but that's the picture really that many people still have of nature, and that's of course an, a picture that does, doesn't accommodate morality. Um, this is the sort of image of nature that was advocated not by Darwin himself. I should say that Darwin was too great a mind to get trapped in that sort of uh, uh, easy, simplistic sort of notions about nature, but uh, Thomas Henry Huxley, also known as Darwin's bulldog, was the one who promoted this view of nature. And um, as his name already, nickname indicates, he was a very combative character and he had a very combative view of nature. And he saw morality, the only way he could really incorporate it into, into his picture of nature, as, as a counterforce. He would depict nature as harsh and brutish and amoral, and morality was a human invention to keep nature in check. Actually, the, the parallel that he used was, uh, we are the gardeners and nature is the garden and we keep the garden under control. And so just to give you a quote, uh, Huxley here says, this is 100 years ago, the ethical progress of society depends not on imitating the cosmic process, pro cosmic process me meaning nature, the laws of nature, still less in running away from it, but in combating it. So he saw morality as a counterforce. And that this view is still very much with us is clear from a uh, contemporary evolutionary biologist, George Williams, very famous uh, biologist, who uh, wrote articles and gave um, colloquia at different universities under the title, Is Mother Nature a Wicked Old Witch? And so he compared na Mother Nature to a wicked old witch, and his view of morality is the following. I account for morality as an accidental, accidental capability produced in its boundless stupidity by a biological process that is normally opposed to the expression of such a capability. So he sorts of accommodates it, but more as a stupid mistake of modern nature than anything else. So these views, I would say, are extremely pessimistic because basically our moral tendencies, moral sentiments, moral systems have no basis in nature. That means that makes them fairly superficial and artificial. And I think it's an extremely pessimistic view. Now, Peter Kropotkin, a Russian prince and anarchist, wrote a book in 1902, Mutual Aid, which was largely opposed to the views of Huxley. And Kropotkin's evidence was not nearly as strong as his political agenda, and everyone will admit that, but he was right nonetheless. He argued that the struggle for life is just a metaphor, should not be taken literally, and that actually many animals survive by doing exactly the opposite of struggling with each other, by cooperating with each other. And we now have, uh, over the last 20 years, I think, in, in nature, tons of examples of cooperation among animals. I mean, there's no lack of examples of that, and I'll just give you one. What you see here is one of those very shallow salt water lakes in uh, Kenya. And from above, you can see thousands of flamingos, usually. And in this case, you see thousands of pelicans, white pelicans. 
And what these pelicans do is they float around in the water and they paddle with their feet and they make these semi-circles. I can't point it out, but you see a semi-circle of, in the middle of the slide at the bottom, you see a, a semi-circle of pelicans who paddle with their feet and the fish are all driven together at a particular spot and then synchronously they pick them up. And so each pelican this way probably gets a lot more fish than when he was fishing on his own. Uh, and this is one example, one of the lots of examples that we have of animal cooperation or what Kropotkin would call mutual aid. Now ironically, at the same time that biologists were discovering all these examples uh, and making great progress in the understanding of cooperative and altruistic behavior, some have made altruism sound like just another form of egoism. And in the case of the pelicans, this is obviously a right approach in the sense that these pelicans, each one of them gets something out of this at the same moment. It's an immediate reward system. And there's no reason to assume that any of these pelicans has a desire to be nice to the other one. That's not, we don't need to invoke that sort of motivations. We can just invoke selfish motivations for what they're doing here. But that's not always the case in nature. There's lots of helpful acts that have a delay. The payoff is delayed tremendously sometimes, like years or maybe even generations, who knows. Uh, so if you take, for example, a mongoose who climbs onto the top of a termite hill and warns everyone for predators that fly in from above, this mongoose is exposing himself, taking tremendous risks, attracting attention to himself at the wrong moment, really. And uh, it's doubtful, of course, that this mongoose follows any of the calculations that we biologists have about why he's doing this. We have, of course, all sorts of explanations of why this behavior may have evolved. But for the mongoose in this particular situation, for him himself, there's no reason to assume that he has any understanding of how this may pay off in the future. And that's the case really with a lot of forms of, of cooperation that you see in the animal kingdom. The payoffs are invisible to the participants, which means that the motives cannot be selfish. And this is the big distinction that Ernst Meyer already made, and it's, you mean it's, it's very old in evolutionary biology, the distinction between what we call, let's say, the psychological level or the proximate level of behavior and the evolution that takes place over millions of years. So evolution follows, uh, and natural selection follows a much slower process that takes place over millions of years that is invisible to the participants. And all that the participants, the individuals know is the situation right now and how they're gonna to respond to particular situations. And so you can be perfectly unselfish, genuinely unselfish at the proximate level whereas at the same time your behavior evolved for certain reasons of self-preservation or survival. And this brings me to the second metaphor that has gotten us into trouble. The first one is the struggle for life metaphor. The second one is the selfish gene metaphor, which I consider a metaphor that has now outlived its usefulness. The selfish gene metaphor has led to the idea that since our genes are selfish, we must be selfish by extension too. Uh, we are sort of selfish by association. Now, given how natural selection works, I'm not going to go into details today, it is okay to say that genes promote themselves. I think that's an okay phrase to say. But obviously, genes cannot be selfish. They don't even have a self, so where would they be selfish? So let's take a quote from Dawkins. Oh yeah, this is my improvement of the title of Dawkins. Instead of the selfish gene, it should be the self-promoting gene. Of course, the marketing department of his publisher would probably not have agreed with the improvement that I propose here. Here we have a quote from Dawkins. I'm not gonna read the whole quote, but the last end says, let us try to teach generosity and altruism because we are born selfish. No, we are not born selfish. Natural selection could be interpreted as a process of genetic self-promotion, but we're not born selfish. That is a, a psychological statement that we cannot make. Same uh, was said by um, George Williams, who said that we have been evolved to be selfish, and I don't think that's necessarily the case. We have, to a large extent, evolved to be cooperative. Now, the realization that not everything is selfishness in the animal kingdom or in the human mind is penetrating not only biology. Similar movements are underway in economy, where rational choice models are being questioned by Robert Frank and other economists, and in social psychology, where people who have studied altruism and motivational uh, systems for a long time 
have concluded that uh, there is such a thing as genuine altruism in the human species. For example, Dan Batson, who has worked all his life on this issue, has concluded that the attitude of social psychologists towards altruism is similar to the attitude of the Victorians towards sex. They cannot handle it and they try to explain it away. <laughs> and Lauren Wispay, who has also worked all his life on this issue, concludes that rewards is what sympathy is not about. Even if one always derived pleasure from helping others, it would not follow that one helps others in order to feel pleasure. And actually, if selfish motives enter into acts of sympathy, it sort of destroys the sympathy. And he, he wrote a whole book about that particular issue. So it's not just in biology that we are questioning now these, um, the, the mixing, let's say, of ultimate and proximate mechanisms, but also outside that field. Now, I wrote a book, Good Natured, in which I made all these points at much greater length than I can do here, and it was barely out a couple of months, or the following thing happened. I don't know if you can see what happens here, uh, but this is at the Brookfield Zoo. Uh, Binti, a female gorilla, rescued a boy who fell into her enclosure, and she transported, she picked, she picked up the boy, held it for a while, and then transported him over quite a distance uh, to a place where uh, people could take care of the boy. Um, I did not pay Binti to do this. Uh, but it sort, of, sort of made the point in a nutshell that these animals can do complex things in which they take care of each other. And, and actually what was most surprising is how surprised people were. Uh, maybe because this is the view we have of uh, gorillas. Because I think no one who works with great apes was necessarily surprised uh, by her actions. Um, because this is not such an unusual thing to do for them, to each other at least. They normally don't do it to people, but they do do it to each other. And, and of course, immediately when this happened, there were some scientists, I must say, none of, no primatologists, but some scientists outside of primatology, who came up with simplifying sort of explanations. And the one I heard over and over uh, was the one that, uh, the one that Binti had a confused maternal instinct. Well, let's imagine here, here's Binti. She's in her enclosure where normally no people come. And a, a boy long like this, white, uh, with his shirt and shoes and everything, falls in from above, drops there, is unconscious. She has her own kid on her back, and she's maternally confused. Uh, for me, that's a very hard explanation to swallow. Uh, I do admit it's possible that her training may have been involved in, in this and certainly her, uh, she was very used to people, she had, was actually partly raised by people, so I'm sure that sort of thing may have played a role, but the act itself required some intelligence and decision making and that's what she did and, and, and required uh, probably emotions of sympathy which we know uh, apes have. And actually on the, the next day I was in the Milwaukee Zoo. I was in the wrong zoo. The Brookfield Zoo had 20,000 people. In addition, there was, you all wanted to see Binti. In addition, there was the Democratic Convention where all these Democrats wanted to see Binti as well. Um, <laughs> and I was at the Brookfield Zoo, at the Milwaukee Zoo, uh, talking with caretakers about their bonobos. And they gave me an example in response to the Binti case, which was just as striking, I think, but of course would never made the newspapers. This was, they have an old female, uh, Kitty is her name, who is blind and cannot find her way around in the building in which uh, she's kept. And so sometimes the oldest male of the group goes over to her and takes her by the hand and leads her around or carries her even around. Well, so that's at least as striking, but of course this is something that happens among the apes and is not nearly as interesting from a publicity perspective as when they save a little boy. Now before I tell you something about my own research on this sort of issue, um, I should add that um, I got into issues of sympathy and empathy and reconciliation and so on sort of backwards. Uh, I don't have a very rosy picture necessarily of the animal kingdom. I don't necessarily believe that animals are always nice and friendly with each other. Uh, I started out studying aggression and violence. And this was in the time that Lawrence's book had come out uh, on aggression. 
I was a graduate student and there was funding available at that time for research on aggressive behavior. Lots of studies were being done both here and uh, in Europe on aggressive behavior. And I noticed very quickly watching a group of macaques who are supposedly an aggressive species uh, that they spent maybe 3%, 4% of their time on aggressive behavior and that's all. For the rest of the time they're playing and grooming and sitting together and sleeping together and they actually seem quite happy and harmonious. And, and so I got interested in how is it possible to have these outbursts of aggression and then at other times to get along so, so nicely and to be so cooperative in many ways. And so I got interested in the discrepancy between those two things and how they could be reconciled. And so I have seen my share of power struggles and blood and violence and don't have any illusions in that regard. And of course, tomorrow you will hear from uh, Dr. Richard Wrangham uh, a lot more about violence. But of course the potential, the, the fact that these animals have the potential to kill each other and the potential to be so violent makes it so interesting to look at conflict resolution. Because really they're resolving a problem and, and why would you be interested in problems that are being resolved that are minor problems? I think they're resolving major problems in their societies and that's why I'm interested in this issue. Well, here we have an act of aggression between chimpanzees. In, on the right, a male who attacks a female and is mainly using his hands and feet. Uh, a lot of the aggression in the animal kingdom, as you know, is, is ritualized. And so um, usually male chimps don't use their teeth when they fight with females, but they may use their teeth when they fight with other males. Now, we're getting more and more interested in what happens afterwards. And here you see, for example, after a fight between two male chimpanzees at the Arnhem Zoo colony, one male on the right uh, holds out his hand, opens his hand to the other one, and invites him. And about a second after I took the picture, the two males came together in the fork of the tree and embraced and kissed each other. And then they climbed to the ground and they groomed each other. And we call that a reconciliation. And I'll give you one more example. Here we have a female on the right who is approaching a male who beat her up. She offers her hand for a hand kiss to the male. Then they engage in a mouse to mouse kiss, which is the typical uh, reconciliation pattern of the species. And look at the female on the left. So there's an old female watching all this on the left. And the young female also goes to her and bears her teeth and, and complains to her in a particular sound. And then the old female taps her on the back and makes these reassuring movements on her. Now the first contact we call a reconciliation, the second contact we call a consolation. So a reconciliation is defined as a friendly contact between two opponents not long after a fight. And a consolation is friendly contacts with bystanders who were not involved in the conflict. And the behavior of those two is different. Like a reconciliation is more often kissing than embracing and consolation is more often embracing than kissing. Um, I should say that in the last 20 years or so, we, the first study that we did was, this I think is 20 years ago, um, th there is now a whole network of people doing conflict resolution studies on primates and I think there's, uh, we have a, um, a bulletin on the internet, we have like 100 subscribers and I think f about 50% of them are actively involved in some form of research on reconciliation. And reconciliation behavior has now been described for at least 20 or probably 25 different species of primates. Um, uh, and also in the field, not just in captivity, also in the field and there's also uh, experimental studies that are going on and so it's it seems to be very widespread and we try to expand now in different directions in the sense that we want to add children to it because uh, of course children show this behavior uh, but it has never been documented with the same sort of rigorous procedures that uh, we follow in the primate studies and we want to add um, non-primates to the list uh, because I'm pretty convinced that it also occurs in animals other than primates. Uh, when I first discovered uh, reconciliation in chimpanzees, the first reaction of people was, you know, what do you expect? Chimps do everything that people do, so of course, yeah, they do reconciliation, but it's probably limited to the chimpanzee. Well, that, that explanation didn't make sense to me because if you think about why they would be doing it, the only reason you can come up with is that there is some sort of relationship between two individuals that is disturbed, but they attach value to that relationship and they need to repair the relationship. 
Well, the need to repair relationships is not limited to chimps at all. That should be present in many species that have cooperative relationships where the individuals recognize each other. And so uh, hyenas, dolphins, elephants, wolves, uh, you name it, all these cooperative animals with highly complex societies should have something like a reconciliation process. Otherwise, it's hard to imagine how they deal with the issues of aggression. And so we're expecting that, that it's not limited to the primates. And just to show you um, two aspects of the complexity of conflict resolution in non-human primates, both from chimpanzees. First is mediation. And that's a behavior that thus far has not been described uh, for other animals than chimpanzees. And I should add that since people have looked at thousands and thousands of reconciliations in monkeys and haven't ever described this sort of mediation, it probably doesn't occur. And what happens here is, for example, you have in, this is at the Arnhem Zoo again, but we have recently seen examples at Yerkes Primate Center also. You have two males who have been running around screaming and fighting and stuff like that. Uh, and instead of avoiding each other, which they could easily do because this is a very large island, they sit at a short distance from each other and they avoid eye contact. So uh, if the male on the left looks up, the one on the right will look at the sky, and if the one on the right looks up, the one on the left will pick up some object and inspect it. So it's like two men at the bar who don't get along, sort of. <laughs> and under these circumstances, then, you may have a female, usually an older female, who uh, mediates between them. And so a female may walk up to the male on the left, start grooming him, uh, groom him for a couple of minutes, and then she walks very slowly from him to the other male. And then he will walk right behind her, so he doesn't need to make eye contact with the opponent. And if he doesn't follow, she may turn around and pull at his arm to make him follow. So it seems to be an intentional process. Then she grooms the other guy, and so you have three chimps sitting there grooming, and then at some point she leaves, and then the two males continue grooming, but by that time then, of course, they're grooming each other. And so she has brought the two males together. Now, what is interesting about that sort of behavior is, first of all, the cognition involved. The female needs to understand what happened between these males, that there's a problem between these males, and how to solve the problem between them. And that may require the sort of social awareness that uh, maybe many monkeys don't have. The second thing is that there needs to be some motivation. So uh, you can think of very short-term uh, motivations for the females, such as if males are tense, they take it out often on the females, and so it may be to her advantage to fix the problem between them. And you can think maybe even of longer-term motivations where she has an interest, a certain stake, in a harmonious community. And I've called that community concern, is that I think uh, you don't need to invo invoke group selection or anything like that to explain it, but I think it's in the interest of all members, or at least most members who live in a society, to maintain the peace in that society. And so the female becomes a peacemaker, probably because it's in her own interest to have a harmonious group life. Well, this is mediation, you could call this from below, because the female is usually subordinate to the males in chimpanzee society. And this is mediation from above, which is very normal in chimpanzees, at least in captive groups, uh, where we have, a, in this case, an adult male, the alpha male, who intervenes in a dispute and breaks up the, the fight. So here we have two females, the one on the complete left and the one on the complete right, who during one of our food tests started screaming and yelling at each other. And the male comes over and sort of holds it, you know, and stops them, and then sits between them, usually until uh, the tensions disappear. Well, it doesn't mean that they completely disappear. You know how that goes with people also, but uh, um, till they disappear, at least to the extent that there's no fighting anymore. So again, this is mediation, and again, this is a form of conflict resolution at a higher level where third parties get involved in the relationships of others. This is just to remind you um, of the relationships among the various primate species. Uh, I cannot point, well, I can try to point, but I don't think you're going to see much. Let me see here. No, this is not going to work. But you see on the left a branch which is called humans and apes. Basically, we are apes, of course. You may not think of yourself as an ape, but you are an ape. And uh, so 30 million years ago, we had the split between the old world monkeys and the 
old world humans and apes. Uh, and then about 8 million years ago, the split was between gorilla and others, uh, and about uh, 6 million years ago between humans and the two pan species, which are chimpanzees and bonobos. And chimpanzees and bonobos are very closely related and are put in the same genus for that reason. So if we talk about monkeys, I will present you some monkey data, even though this is the conference on apes at the end of an age. Uh, I'll just bring in some monkeys. Uh, you, you have to notice how much different they are and how d distant they are compared to the apes. Oh, this is not monkeys. These are, these are still bonobos. Just very briefly, bonobos do all these things that chimps do with kissing and embracing. They uh, do with sexual behavior. And they have very human-like sexual behavior. Uh, I'm not sure I should be getting into this. This is the missionary position, as you know. It has a sort of interesting history, uh, how it got that name. Uh, the history of that is that there was a time in the 50s, do I have time to get into that? In the, in, in the 50s, um, the anthropologists were very eagerly looking for all sorts of examples of behavior that could not be explained biologically and only culturally. And I think very stupidly they got into sex as well. Sex is so obviously a biologically determined behavior that it you know, goes all the way from insects to us. All sorts of animals have sexual interactions. So they claimed two areas of human sexuality uh, for the cultural domain, and the two were orgasm. They said only we have orgasms, and often even said only Western culture knows orgasms. Um, and the other one was the missionary position, which was at that time called just a face-to-face -face position, but uh, probably they thought that it was such a good innovation that it needed to be taught to preliterate people, and who better to do that than the missionaries? And, <laughs> And I don't think the missionaries were supposed to assume the position, necessarily. <laughs> so the bonobos, anyway, the bonobos do all these things that chimps do, uh, kissing and embracing and so on, after fights, they do in a sexual manner. Now let me say a few things about monkeys, because when I came to the US, uh, I came to um, the Wisconsin Primate Center, not far from here, actually. Um, they had mainly rhesus monkeys, and rhesus monkeys have the reputation, and deservedly so, I think, of being about the nastiest, most aggressive primates that exist. Very hierarchical primates. Actually, Abraham Maslow, the, the psychologist, uh, compared them to Nazis. He, he wrote in the 40s, so I think it made a lot of sense to make that comparison. So he, they had a fascist quality for him. Well, they're very hierarchical and very aggressive, and so I thought, even they, because they have certainly also a level of cooperation in their society, even the rhesus monkeys should have reconciliations, if it is to work the way I think it works. So I thought this was a very interesting challenge to get into rhesus monkeys, and uh, designed a study uh, to study reconciliation in, in them. And I compared them with stumptail macaques, which we also had at the same uh, facility, sa exactly the same environment, so it was a very easy comparison. And stumptails are much nicer. Uh, in the words of George Bush, they are the kinder, gentler sort of society. <laughs> and after I had discovered that rhesus monkeys show reconciliation behavior and stumptails show reconciliation behavior, uh, but stumptails do it at a much higher level than the rhesus monkeys. Uh, I got interested in doing an experiment on learning of uh, reconciliation behavior. And just to give you a little background on that, is that there is almost no literature on conflict resolution uh, f from the same perspective that we use for primates for humans. If you go to the library and you look for aggression and violence, you will find tons of books. The whole library is full of books uh, with aggression and violence in humans. If you look for peacemaking, reconciliation, that sort of issues, you will find virtually nothing. There's maybe a handful of articles on humans, on reconciliation behavior. And so one day I challenged a group of developmental psychologists saying that, uh, well, um, we have all this data on primates, what do you have? And if you don't have it, why don't you have it? And um, the defense that I got from some of them 
is, well, uh, in monkeys and apes, of course, this is all instinctive and very simple, but in humans, it's extremely complicated. And uh, so that's how they sort of justified not having collected anything on that. And um, what stuck in my mind is instinctive, because that's really a term that we don't use anymore. I don't even know what it would be, instinctive. Um, because basically all behavior, in, uh, certainly in primates, but I think in um, almost all organisms, is a product of environment and genes, and it's very hard to tease apart what is what. And so I got interested in the learning of peacemaking skills, anyway. And designed an experiment in which I put some uh, juvenile stumptail monkey, this is a juvenile stumptail monkey, together with uh, juvenile rhesus monkeys in a design, well, don't try to read this, I'm going to explain this to you. What we did is we housed rhesus monkeys for, juvenile rhesus monkeys for five months together with juvenile stumptail monkeys. The stumptails were selected slightly older so that they would be dominant on the assumption that uh, it would be, the rhesus would learn more from an older a dominant model than from younger individuals. And they were housed together day and night uh, and five months is a very long time in the development of a rhesus monkey. I've compared it to putting a human child for two years in a chimp colony, and I can assure you, you get a very different human child back after that exposure than before it went in. And then the control procedure is exactly the same. The only difference is that, uh, of course, there's no stump tails in the control procedure. This is all done with rhesus monkeys. Then after the experiment, we split them out again, so we have a group of rhesus monkeys that was exposed to stem tails and a group of rhesus monkeys that was not exposed to stem tails. That's the design of the experiment. And just to tell you what happened, if you look at the white bars first, the white bars are the control rhesus monkeys, and you see they stay all at approximately the same level of reconciliation throughout the entire experiment. So uh, the experiment didn't do much to their reconciliation behavior as you would expect. Then if you look at the stem tails, which are the hatched bars on the right, uh, we don't have one for the precondition, but for all other conditions, they're fairly high, as we would expect the stem tails reconcile at a high rate throughout the experiment. Then the middle bars, which are gray, um, are the experimental rhesus monkeys. And in the precondition, they are at the same level as the controls, and also during the first phase of co-housing, you see that they're at the same level. Uh, then they go up and up, and even in the post phase, where they are split off from the stem tails, they reconcile as much as the stem tail monkeys did. And so what we have done is we have changed the behavior of rhesus monkeys. We have uh, induced reconciliation behavior at a much higher frequency than normal for rhesus monkeys by exposing them uh, to stem tail monkeys. So we have sort of created a new and improved rhesus monkey. Uh, it's a, really an experiment on social culture. We have changed the social culture of, uh, of a monkey. And the fact that we can do this with a monkey by changing the social environment, it, it gives, of course, a very optimistic message in the sense that if you can change rhesus monkeys into peacemakers, you probably can change human children also into peacemakers. I'm not proposing that we should house human children with stump tails necessarily, but <laughs> there must be other ways of changing the environment. Now get into the issue of empathy. Um, empathy is all over in human society. I mean, when you go to the movies, or like these children who go to a puppet theater and are responding to what's happening there, uh, you know, we, we feel joy when, or we feel happy when everything is going well for the individual we identify with, or we feel sad if everything is going wrong, and we are distressed when there's violence and so on. And so, um, we really identify easily with others and feel their pain, as Clinton would put it, uh, and, and get involved in their emotions very easily. And so it's a capacity that we are very good at and very strong in. This is a drawing of two soldiers uh, in Vietnam, uh, one consoling the other. And what is interesting about consolation is that when we did our first post-conflict studies, we thought reconciliation was the big issue and was the most interesting issue, and now I'm starting to think that maybe consolation, which is much more an altruistic kind of behavior, is the more interesting one. 
And here you see consolation in chimpanzees. The male on the right has been defeated in a battle with another male and is screaming. And a juvenile has come over and put, put an arm around him. And that's what we call consolation behavior. Well, this is some data on it. I'm not sure I want to go into the details of the data. But just believe me, we repeated the studies that were done in Arnhem in a much more controlled fashion and found again that chimpanzees have a strong tendency to approach victims of aggressive behavior, especially if these victims uh, were subjected to serious aggressive behavior. And so they show all the responses that you would expect if consolation is a mechanism to alleviate tensions in the partner. And then we repeated all these studies. Uh, Filippo O'Reilly, my coworker, did that on macaques and found nothing. Macaques even some species, they avoid the victims of aggression. They stay away from them. And recently, Peter Verbeek, another student of mine, worked on capuchin monkeys and found that capuchins have uh, no consolation in the sense that bystanders approach victims of aggression, but capuchins at least try to approach others. So they, they seek consolation from others. They sort of invite it from others, but it's not generously sort of offered by the others, uh, spontaneously offered. So it may be that chimpanzees, and I would say by extension all the great apes and humans, are special in that we have reached a level of empathy, so to speak, uh, that produces consolation behavior. Now, consolation is very common in the human species, of course. Anyone who's a parent of young children is basically in the consolation business the whole day. Uh, it's, uh, we do that automatically and very readily. But it's striking that in the monkeys this far, we have not discovered it. And if you look at the literature on uh, empathy, because maybe empathy is involved, empathy has low levels and high levels. The lowest level would be something like one baby cries and another baby cries. That's an emotional contagion and doesn't require a lot of cognitive capacities, probably. And the higher levels are where I can sort of position myself in your shoes and understand the world, so to speak, from your perspective. Well, that's probably a very high level of cognitive ability is required there. And if you look at the literature on that in human development, it usually brings in words like self and self-awareness or self-consciousness in there, is that you can only reach these higher levels of empathy if there's enough distinction between self and other possible. So self-consciousness comes in there. And there's a very interesting study, um, a Swiss scientist, Doris bischoff Köhler has done for 10 years experiments on testing children on their level of empathy. And she does that sort of experiments like the experimenter is sitting at a table with a child and her spoon breaks. The experimenter's spoon breaks. And then see if the child understands what happened and offers her own spoon or offers some other solution. Uh, so understands that something bad happened to the experimenter. Uh, this scientist found that there's a correlation between the level of empathy and recognition in a mirror. That children who have reached the level where they can uh, show empathy, higher levels of empathy, are also the children who have started recognizing themselves in a mirror. And so she links those two. She says, mirror self-recognition taps into self-consciousness at a level where this form of empathy is possible. And we know, of course, that of all the primates tested, uh, unequivocally, certainly, uh, the chimpanzees and, and the other great apes uh, recognize themselves in a mirror. And so it is possible that chimps and other apes and humans have reached a level of self-consciousness at which this higher form of empathy is possible uh, and maybe not possible in uh, monkeys. The second issue I would like to address is food sharing and reciprocity in food sharing. Um, here we have a quote from an anthropologist who was interested in the evolution of reciprocity, and he basically says that uh, reciprocity is widespread in human societies. And he, he sort of dismissed at the time the food sharing that was already known at the time of the gomba chimpanzees who showed meat sharing. This is a uh, uh, aerial view of the Yerkes field station. Outside of Atlanta, we have a large field station where we keep 2,000 primates and uh, in large enclosures, uh, including some chimpanzees. This is one of the chimpanzees. 
This is actually a view of my office. I have an office at the field station uh, that overlooks the chimp compound. This is Mike Sears, my assistant, who is bringing food to the chimpanzees. And what the chimpanzees do as soon as they see the food is they start hooting and embracing each other, the behavior that we call a celebration. Is instead of competing with each other, as many other animals would do when they see attractive food arriving, the chimps immediately go into a lot of reassurance behavior, which makes the food sharing possible. Then we throw it in from above and we keep it in bundles because it needs to be monopolizable, otherwise there's no point in doing these experiments. Because if one individual can monopolize it, then they can also share it. And so then you get from these clusters of chimps that sh gather around to bundles. Here you see a cluster of sharing chimpanzees. Oh, this is... I'll, I'll get back to this individual. This individual is named Gwynny. On the left, the female. She has a nasty form of begging. What she does is she... She is always more interested in the food that the male is eating, the alpha male, than the food that is all around her. And she puts her hand on his mouth so that he can't chew and then waits till it falls out. <laughs> but it shows how extremely tolerant they are. You know, I mean, this, this alpha male is certainly dominant over her, but he allows her to do that. This is data that shows that chimps share reciprocally in the sense that, uh, well, I'm not going to go into details, but each dot is one pair of adult individuals. And what it shows is that if I share a lot with you, you share a lot with me. If I share very little with you, you share very little with me. And this sort of correlation is the first step that's really required if you want to see a system of reciprocity. And of course, reciprocity is extremely important in human systems of morality. Uh, if you think of obligations, well, where do obligations come from? Largely from systems of reciprocity. And so um, the first step to demonstrate that chimps may have reciprocity is to look at this sort of correlations, but it's not sufficient. There are several ways in which these correlations can come about, and uh, only one of them is what we would say is remembering uh, favors received and doing favors in return, which is really what we think are systems of reciprocity. So we did a series of experiments to tease it apart a little bit better, which is sequential or delayed reciprocity. So we're not just looking at correlations, we're looking at if I do something for you, does that increase the probability that in the near future you're going to do something for me? That's what really what we looked at. And we did that with grooming behavior. Here you see a bunch of grooming chimps. Our chimps groom a lot, and so it's very easy to collect data on that, and what we did is collect data on grooming among them before the food trials. They groom very mutually. It's actually very interesting. Many species of primates groom very one-sidedly. The subordinate grooms the dominant, for example, and the dominant doesn't do much back. Uh, but chimps are very reciprocal groomers. Oh, yeah, this is just to show you that grooming is a service that we pay for. And I think chimps pay for the service, too. This is the data, and I, it's hard for me to point at it, but the, the left bar is clearly the tallest one. I think you can see that. Uh, what the left bar shows is how much food does A get from B after A has groomed B. And you see, so this, if A has groomed B, A has a much higher probability of getting something from B in the subsequent food trial that occurs hours later. And the other bars show, uh, for example, the one on the right shows that how much food B gets from A is not affected by how much A groomed B. So it seems to be a tit-for-tat sort of thing, is that if I groom you, my chances of getting food from you are improved. But your chances of getting food from me are not improved by that. So it seems to be on an exchange basis that this occurs, and this is much stronger evidence for reciprocity uh, than previous evidence. Oh, this is Gwynny again. And what is interesting about Gwynny is that she's the most stingy female that we have. So we have very generous individuals. The males are usually very generous, but also some high-ranking females uh, and uh, some very stingy individuals. And what we found is that, uh, and this relates to the whole issue of moralistic aggression, as it was called by uh, Bob Trivers 20 years ago. He said that if you have a system of reciprocity, 
you need to have some sanctions against cheaters or some sort of punishment for individuals who try to get more out of the system than they contribute. Otherwise, the whole system is going to collapse. And so what we found is that the individuals who are stingy, who don't share very well with the others, when they try to get something from the others, they meet with more aggression. They're more often rejected. And the individuals who are very generous, who share very easily, they also have an easy time getting something from someone else. And so that seems to be related to the whole issue of punishing cheaters. Of course, punishing someone because of behavior that doesn't fit the system is very much related to human morality as well. So in closing, what is exactly my claim and what does it mean? Well, it would be foolish and imprudent, I think, to try to define morality. Um, complex phenomena such as language and politics and morality are very hard to define and all we can really do is sort of circle around the phenomenon and, and look for an outline of the phenomenon. It's a bit like a moth circling around the fire. You can also burn your wings that way. These, these phenomena are really too big necessarily to fit a neat definition. But let me give you my take on morality, my take instead of a definition. My take is that morality is a system of conflict resolution. Uh, the whole world, human world, but also animal world, is full of, full of conflicting interests. Uh, conflict between mates, between parents and children, between the rich and the poor, between the individual and the community. Uh, everywhere are conflicts, but they're also shared interests. Uh, the fact that we live in groups and the fact that chimpanzees live in groups or other animals live in groups means that there must be some advantage to living in groups and so there is a value attached to group life. And so even despite all these conflicting interests, there's an interest in maintaining internal harmony, so to speak, to some degree. And what we do in our moral systems is we search for solutions that satisfy most parties, maybe not all parties, but most parties, that seem fair and we try to set rules of conduct that make a community worth living in. And we call that human morality. And so we say good behavior is what fits that sort of system and bad behavior is what doesn't fit that kind of system. And these rules, I think the specific rules, are not dictated by biology. I don't think you can derive norms directly from biology. Basically, these rules are made amongst ourselves, decided on the basis of the sort of situation we are in. and so. Morality is different in peacetime than in wartime, uh, during starvation and during abundance. And, and so morality follows the environment to some degree and because the rules are flexible to some degree. Then we internalize the rules and develop an autonomic conscience out of that. Now, ethical debate and moral reasoning and a conscience are not necessarily things that I expect to find in the animal kingdom. So I'm not claiming that there are any moral beings other than ourselves in the animal kingdom. No, my claim is a lot more modest than that. I think that many social animals have inclinations and capacities without which we would never have been able to develop moral systems. So things like sympathy and empathy, uh, forming social rules, enforcing social rules, reciprocity and the obligations associated with it, conflict resolution, uh, equal distribution of resources, all these issues can be found to some degree in a chimpanzee society and we would never have developed moral systems if we did not have similar sort of inclinations. And so we did not start from scratch, so to speak, when we developed human morality, but we had a lot of natural tendencies to work with. Now, this view places morality a lot closer to human nature than, than calling it an innovation or a cultural product or a counterforce, as Huxley did. And so I view compassion and other tendencies related to that very much as part of what we are and as much part of what we are as competition. And you, you may have noticed um, that there are social Darwinists, and they're still basically among us to some degree, who look at callousness uh, as a natural, hence perfectly okay tendency. So let the poor fend for themselves, that's how nature works. 
uh, is a bit uh, that you can still hear from some politicians today. And what I'm saying is that the natural world could equally well inspire, if you look at uh, non-human primates, for example, an ideology of social responsibility. And just to make that comment in a political fashion, let me show you the following cartoon. Let me read this for you. This is, of course, uh, Binti here. If a poor child fell through the welfare safety net, which one would you trust to rush to his aid? So if we look at our closest relatives, without denying that they are very competitive, without denying that they can be very violent, and that there's lots of selfishness there, uh, it's actually rampant, I would say, there is an other side to these animals, and I think that's a side that has been overlooked for too long. Thank you. Once again, we will invite Richard. questions from the audience. Well, I listen to Francis too. Well, I have some questions too. And here come cards down the, the aisle. Raise your hand. We have about 15 minutes, and you may forward your questions to the ushers, and they'll get up here. I wanted to start by asking if any of the panelists had responses or questions for Dr. DeWall. Yeah. Um, in a very influential paper, which was written in the 1970s, Robert Trivers talked about reciprocal altruism and the fact that under certain conditions, uh, this could increase Delayed and reciprocal altruism could increase the, uh, the inclusive fitness of individuals. So that's sort of, I'd like you to comment on that. And the second question that I have is, uh, in many societies, uh, nepotism seems to play a very important role in mediating morality. And I'd also like your comments on that as well. Um, so you ask whether um, reciprocal altruism can increase inclusive fitness? It is from your, ex your observations of the chimpanzees. Well, I'm personally not convinced that, uh, because often we um, sort of say it is either kin selection and, or it is reciprocal altruism between non-relatives. I think these things often interact and overlap, if that's what you mean, is that you can have reciprocal deals between brothers, for example, uh, and maybe their relationship would not work if there was not some form of reciprocity between them. And some, some people have even argued that uh, kin selection was there first and the level of cooperation that it produced may then have been picked up by non-related individuals in reciprocal altruism and that sort of uh, kin selection produced the behaviors that were picked up by uh, and then used in other cooperative systems. Nepotism is a word that I don't like using. I, I can see why sometimes people would use it, but of course, if nepotism just means uh, favoring kin in your cooperative behavior, uh, I think we should just call it favoring kin or kin bias or whatever. Nepotism has a very negative connotation. And uh, of course, yeah, this, the, uh, morality and kinship are very closely intertwined in the sense that you have more obligations towards certain individuals, certainly close kin, than towards other individuals. And so uh, altruism is not spread sort of randomly. It's very focused usually. And then uh, the sort of circle that goes out from 
then you, then you get the, the clan and then you get the larger group or community or whatever and uh, so uh, it is certainly not randomly distributed and such a thing as generalized altruism is nonsense from a biological perspective it cannot exist really uh, first question from the audience do, uh, do your research and observations suggest that females tend to be the peacemaker more often supporting genuine sex role differences that might extend to humans. Please comment on gender differences in all forms of peacemaking and cooperative behavior. Well, it's an interesting issue. Is that in that female chimps are actually worse at peacemaking among themselves than males. And, um, uh, well, before I get into the human literature on that, there's very little of that. Uh, what we see is that chimpanzee males have a lot more fights among themselves than females, but also make, um, make up much more readily than females. If females have a fight, it's usually a very bad fight, and uh, it takes them a long time, uh, if, if at all, uh, to reconcile. And um, if you want to draw human parallels, I can mention two things. One is anecdotal, the other one is a study. Anecdotally, there was a Dutch swimming coast, co coach who was once, um, who had uh, coached uh, girls for a long time for a swimming team and had moved to the boys team and, and I read an interview with her and she explained at great lengths that if the girls in her team had a fight, uh, it would go on for months and months and months. Whereas if the boys had a fight, you know, the same evening, uh, they would make up, have a beer and it would be over. And so she didn't want to deal with that anymore. As far as the research is concerned, there was a Finnish team that has researched uh, aggression levels at, uh, at schools, uh, school-age children, uh, like 10 or 12 years old children. And what they did is they asked the children after class whether they had a fight. Because as you all know, if you watch children, you will see the boys fight and you will hardly see any girls fight. If you ask them afterwards, what they found is the girls have as many fights as the boys do, but they're much more subtle. You don't notice them by observation. Then they ask them, how long can you stay mad at uh, your opponent? And they asked it every day uh, in all cases. And they said, the boys usually were very proud to say, oh, I can stay mad like half an hour or so, you know? <laughs> but, but the girls would say, oh, all my life, they would say that. <laughs> and so I think in terms of um, my view of chimpanzees, and I think by extension to some degree of humans also, is that for the female, the difference between a friend and an enemy is huge. This is a friend and that's an enemy and there is nothing in between. Uh, for the males, these things um, are much more vaguely defined and so sometimes you may need your enemy for particular things. So you need to get along with him to some degree and your friend can become a rival very easily on particular issues. And so um, they have a much more flexible, opportunistic sort of system of uh, fighting and reconciling. Now, what the chimps females do in Arnhem, the mediation process is of course also a form of peacemaking, but they're making peace between others and they're very good at that and very diplomatic and skilled at that and do the same things they often do with their juveniles, with their offspring. And so I'm not saying that females don't understand the peacemaking process, they are perfectly good at it, but with their rival females, they're not very good at it. It reminds me of what Churchill said about nations, that nations do not have friends, or they only have allies. <laughs> Remember? Nations. Uh, one brief housekeeping note, if Mr. Jim Eggert is in the audience, uh, please report to the registration desk at the back of the arena, Mr. Jim Eggert. Is that a question you're going to answer? This is a question, but it's, it's written in Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably why you're reading it and not me. Uh, okay. Uh, if, I'll translate it. If you give three uh, apes every day less food, starting with a lot of food, uh, are they going to fight after a couple of days? Or do they equally divide it? Well, I think that will depend on how far you go in this whole experiment. <laughs> if you don't starve them, you know, if there is a, a decent amount of food, I think they will, stay, they will remain uh, distributing it among themselves. 
I'm not sure what would happen if they're really going to get starved. I, I've never done that sort of experiment, uh, and I'm not, you know, this is not the first thing I'm going to try, I think. <laughs> Another question from the audience. Is there an obvious uh, system of laws that individuals in chimpanzee societies are punished for not following? Well, obvious in the sense that um, it's the same for all chimp societies. I don't think so. I, I think each chimp society probably arrives at uh, a sort of understanding between the individuals what A will accept from B and, and, and not. And, and this may change over time depending on the different positions that individuals occupy. But there are social rules, of course, in the sense that, for example, the alpha male will not allow an other male to mate with um, particular females and will interfere with that, and these other males know that and s seek ways to circumvent that particular rule. And the females know it also very well. And uh, that's not necessarily the same in every group of chimpanzees. And uh, I've, in monkeys, for example, I've seen we had such a contrast in Wisconsin. We had one group of monkeys where the alpha male was like that, and basically he was the only one who copulated in the daytime and at night there was probably a lot of other copulations going on because we found with paternity testing that he was certainly not the only one who sired offspring. In the other group that we had, which was basically next doors, we had five adult males who accepted to copulate with females in each other's view, including the alpha male and including all the others. And so the social rules, so to speak, for that group were very different than from the first group. And I think the same variation probably exists in chimpanzee communities. About two questions related to your discussion of the experiment in, you know, with the rhesus monkeys being placed in with the stump tails. Were the rhesus monkeys that learned reconciliation from the stump tails returned to a rhesus group, and did they continue reconciliation behaviors at the same level if they were returned? Well, unfortunately, we had to break off the experiment, uh, as it usually goes at primate centers, is that these monkeys are in demand for all sorts of things, and so uh, I could not keep them around for a long enough time to test these sort of assumptions. My bet would be that if you would reintroduce them to a regular rhesus group, they would have to revert very quickly to regular rhesus behavior. Okay. Otherwise, their uh, nicer tendencies, so to speak, would get them into a lot of trouble, probably. If they had stayed among themselves, then, of course, and that's the sort of experiment that we are planning now for the future, if you keep them among themselves after exposure to another species, uh, and have them uh, maybe even breed. You can, you can probably even see how they may transmit this tendency to their own offspring. And so uh, it would probably be retained for a much longer time. A related question. It seems that when we expose immature human primates to a steady diet of violent TV characters, we have created the rhesus stump tail experiments in reverse, without controls. Do you agree? What should we do about it? And could you design an experiment that would more clearly show the relationship? Well, yeah, I've, you know, there's a lot of research on the effect of violence on TV. I think that people do become immune to it, and I don't think that's necessarily a good thing, in the sense that I still cannot watch a lot of American movies because they're too violent for my taste, because I, was not, I didn't grow up with uh, the level of what is it, 18,000 murders per year that you get on TV here. Uh, so the diet of violence that you have on TV probably has an effect of making people not even reflect on violence uh, because they are so used in seeing it. Uh, I personally don't do research on that. Uh, uh, the only anecdote I can tell you of uh, learned aggressive behavior, so it's the opposite of peacemaking behavior, is we had um, in the chimpanzee community in, in Arnhem, we had a male being killed and castrated by two other males, which was a horrible accident. And it happened in the night cages. And we, we knew, this happened in 1980, we knew which other night cages had a view of what had happened. So the females, in, because this all happened among males, the females in those night cages had seen the incident for sure um, and had followed it. Then um, two weeks later, I believe, one of those females who had seen all this happen uh, made an attack on a young adult male where she clearly went for his testicles. And um, nothing happened. It was, it was, he escaped. But I was so struck by that because in six years of watching these chimps, I'd never seen anything like that, even remotely, you know, where they would be interested in that area of his body. And she clearly was. Um, and I think this is something she may have picked up from that fight. 
So observational learning uh, is probably present uh, in chimpanzees, and this also makes you all the more worried about the violence levels that you see on TV. Do we have any final comments or reflections from the other panelists? Do you suspect that the ability of a species such as the chimpanzee and bonobo and gorilla to develop these kinds of systems that you've been talking about are and or provide the foundation for the kind of symbolic learning capabilities that we find, representational capabilities, the language capabilities of these animals? Well, that's a complex question. I think that, that empathy, if we take that particular characteristic, um, where you sort of can look at the world from the perspective of someone else, um, makes it a lot easier probably to understand what people may be talking about if they're talking with each other. You see what I mean? Is if, if Kanzi or whoever in your group picks up an understanding of spoken language, uh, I, it's hard to imagine how he can do that without also understanding a little bit about the intentions that people have. And understanding intentions is of course related to empathy. So I, I think the capacities involved in the things that I'm talking about are probably also involved in the things that you study to some degree. And that may be why teaching language to a monkey is a lot more challenging because they may not have that level of understanding. And nobody has gotten very far with the monkey and there has been one long-term concerted study. Oh yeah, someone did a long-term project on monkeys? A language project with monkeys? Yeah? Yes. Siegel in San Diego. Oh. Thank you. We have coffee and other refreshments located out on Ekman Mall. If you head just straight east outside the, uh, the arena up by Christ Chapel, feel free to help yourself to that. That's for you. And we reconvene back here at 3.30. Thank you, Dr. Dewall and the other panelists.